Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Uh, today we are reading a work by Maximus the Confessor called Mystagogy. It is about seeing the structure of God, man, and church and community, the similarities between these structures. That is what he's trying to get at. I'm going to simply read, this is chapter five of his book, Mr. Gogi. And um, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can click on a link so you can go a link in the, in the description. So you can go to the website to read this, this is chapter five. How and in what manner? So folks, uh, it's going to take about 20 minutes. So listen to it, try to formulate your questions after we're done with, with this, I'm going to try to make some remarks about Maximus's approach to theology, to philosophy. And uh, then I will take a whole bunch of questions and then we'll have a general discussion, okay? Maximus is a, around 780 uh, or so. So he sits on the top of Gospel of John. His, uh, his approach is very much Johannine approach. He's the one who brings together the Eastern and Western way of thinking. Uh, by that, I mean Eastern in the sense that one who, that is focused on experiencing, experience of God or experience of consciousness. And also he is Western in the sense that he is extremely systematic and precise about his words. So he brings together East and the West. This is his part of the Orthodox uh, Christianity, which is quite different from the Western Christianity, Western both being, um, you know, uh, Catholic as well as Protestant. So it's a very different approach. So what I'm hoping is that this reading will give you a flavor of how he approaches uh, Christianity and philosophy and religion, and then would love to discuss this. It's a very ambitious project to bring a thinker that person who is not that, that most people are not that familiar with, but I'm going to try to do that, okay? All right, so let's dive into this. This is um, Maximus, the Confessor, Mr. Gogi, chapter five. How and in what manner still is the church an image of image and figure of the soul considered by itself? And he used to teach that it is not only of the whole man that is as composed of body and soul joined together that God's holy church can be an image, but also of the soul considers, considered in itself by reason. For, said he, the soul in general consists of an intellectual and a vital faculty. The former moved freely according to its will and the latter remaining without choice in accordance with nature. And the contemplative power belongs to the intellectual faculty and the active power belongs to the vital faculty. The contemplative power he used to call the mind, the active power reason. The mind is the mover of the intellectual faculty, whereas reason provides for the vital faculty. The former, that is the mind, is and is called wisdom when it directs itself, its proper movements altogether unswervingly towards God. In the same way, reason is and is called prudence when in uniting to the mind, the activities of the vital faculty wisely governed, governed by it in sensible direction, it shows that it is not different from it but bears the same divine image by virtue as does the mind. This image, he added, is naturally shared both by both mind and reason, as the soul was previously proven to of mind and reason because it is intellectual and rational and the vital faculty is equally evident in both the rational and the vital faculty is equally evident in both mind and reason, for it is not licit to think of either as deprived of life and thus shared by both. By means of the mind, which is also called wisdom, as we said, 
increasing in the habit of contemplation in the ineffable silence and knowledge is led to the truth by enduring an incomprehensible knowledge. For its part, the reason which we call prudence ends up at the good by means of faith in the active engagement of its body in virtue. In both these things consist the true science of divine and human matters, the truly secure knowledge and the term of all divine wisdom according to Christians. And to speak more clearly of these things, he used to say that the soul has a contemplative aspect, as has been said, and also an active aspect. The contemplative aspect he called the mind and the active he called reason, since these are the primary powers of the soul. Moreover, he used to call the mind wisdom and the soul prudence, since these are its primary acts. Going into more detail, he used to say that to the soul belong, through its intelligent mind, wisdom, contemplation, knowledge, and enduring knowledge, all directed towards truth. Through its rational reason belong reasoning, prudence, action, virtue, and faith, all directed to the good. Truth and goodness, he used to say, reveal God. Truth does this when the divine seems to be revealed in its essence. For truth is something simple, unique, one, identical, indivisible, immutable, impassable, all-seeing, and wholly eternal. Goodness, on the other hand, reveals God when it manifests him in its activities. For the good is beneficent and provident and protective of everything that comes from it. In the opinion of etymologists, the word which derives from to be in abundance or to be settled or to run signifies that it is bestower of being, continuation, and movement to all beings. Thus, these five pairs and we have that we have observed in the soul, he spoke of as being understood in a single pair, which signifies God. These pairs are the mind and reason, wisdom and prudence, contemplation and action, knowledge and virtue, enduring knowledge and faith. The pair that reveals God is truth and goodness. When the soul is moved by them to make progress, it becomes united. It becomes united to God. Of all. Okay. When the soul is moved by them to make progress, it becomes united. The God of all in imitating what is immutable and beneficent in his essence and activity by means of its steadfastness in the good and its unalterable habit of choice. And if I might add a brief but useful consideration, this is perhaps the 10 divine strings of spiritual lyre of the soul, which includes the reason resounding in harmony with the spirit through another blessed series of 10, the commandments, which spiritually renders perfect, harmonious, and melodious sounds in praise of God. This is so that we might learn what is the meaning of the ten which sing and the ten which are sung, and how the ten are mystically attuned and united to the other ten. Jesus, my God and Savior, who is completed by me, who I who am saved, brings me back to himself, who is always filled to overflowing with plenitude and who can never be exhausted. He restores me in a marvelous way to myself, or rather to God from whom I received being and towards whom I am directed, long desirous of attaining happiness. Whoever can understand this by having had the experience of these things will completely come to know in clearly having recognized his own dignity 
already through experience, how there is rendered to the image, what is made to the image, how the archetype is honored, what is the power of mystery of our salvation, for whom it was that Christ died, and finally, how we can attain, remain in him and he in us, as he said, and how the word of Lord is right and all his works are faithful. But we have sufficiently spoken of these things, so let us return to the train of our discourse. The mind, he used to say, arrives at the contemplation when it is moved by wisdom, by contemplation to knowledge, by knowledge to enduring knowledge, by enduring knowledge to truth. It is here that the mind finds the term of its movement, for in it are included essence, potency, habit, and act. Now, he used to say that wisdom is the potency of the mind, and that mind is wisdom in potency, that contemplation is a habit, that knowledge is an act, that enduring knowledge of wisdom, contemplation, and knowledge that is of potency, habit, and act is the perpetual and unceasing movement towards the knowable, which transcends knowledge, whose term is truly ultimate knowledge. And what is admirable is how the enduring reality finds its end once it is included or comes to its terms in the truth, that is, in God. For God is truth, is the truth towards which the mind moves continuously and enduringly, and it can never cease its movement since it is not it does not find any discontinuity there for the wonderful grandeur of god's infinity is without quantity or parts and completely without dimension and offers no grip to take hold of it and to know what it is in its essence now what has no discontinuity or which offers no grip at all is not limited by anything. As for reason, it is analogously moved by prudence and arrives at action. Through action, it comes to virtue. Through virtue, it comes to faith, the genuinely solid and infallible certainty of divine realities. The reason possesses it at first in potency by prudence and later it later demonstrates it in act by virtue through its manifestations in works. Indeed, as the scripture has it, faith without works is stead. Now, no reasonable person would ever presume to say that anything dead or without activity should be counted amongst the finer things. But when by means of faith it arrives at the good, which is its term, the reason ends its proper activities because its potency, habit, and act are now concluded. He used to say, in fact, that prudence is the potency of reason, and the reason is the prudence in potency. Also, that action is habit, that virtue is act, and that faith is the inward, unchanging concretization of prudence, action, and virtue that is of potency, habit, and act. Its final term is the good, where ceasing its movement, the reason rests. It is God, precisely, who is the good, at which every potency of every reason is meant to end. How and in what way each of these succeeds and is brought to reality, and what is opposed or allied to each of them, and in what measure is not our present purpose to determine or say. Nevertheless, we should know that every soul, by the grace of the Holy Spirit and his own work and diligence, can unite these things and weave them into each other, reason with mind, prudence with wisdom, action with contemplation, virtue with knowledge, faith with enduring knowledge, without any of these things being inferior or superior to the other in such a way that all excess or defect be eliminated from each of them. To summarize, it means to reduce the ten to one when it will be united to God, who is true, good, one, and unique. It will be beautiful and splendid 
having become similar to him as much as it can by the perfecting of the four basic virtues, which reveal the divine 10 in the soul, include the other blessed 10 of the commandments. In fact, the tetrad is the decade in potency, joined together in a progressive series from the one. So, and moreover, it is itself a monad, which singly embraces the good as a unity and which by, by being itself shared without division reflects the simplicity and indivisibility of the divine activity. It is through them that the soul vigorously keeps its own good free from attack and bravely repels what is foreign to it as evil because it has a rational mind, a prudent wisdom, an active contemplation, a virtuous knowledge, and along with them, an enduring knowledge, which is both very faithful and unchangeable. And it conveys to God the effects wisely joined to their causes and the acts to their potencies. And in exchange for these, it receives deification, which creates simplicity. For thought is the act and manifestation of the mind related as effect to cause. And prudence is the act and manifestation of wisdom and the action of contemplation and virtue of knowledge and faith of enduring knowledge. From these is produced the inward relationship to the truth and the good, which is to God, which he used to call divine science, secure knowledge, love, and peace, in which and by means of which there is deification. This whole real is science because it is the achievement of all knowledge concerning God and divine realities and virtues which are accessible to men. It is knowledge because it genuinely lays hold of the truth and offers a lasting experience of God. It is love because it shares by its whole disposition in the full happiness of God. Finally, it is peace in as much as it experiences the same thing as God and prepares for this experience those who are judged worthy to come to it. If God is completely without change and has nothing to trouble him, for what can escape his view, then peace is an unshaken and unmoved solidity and an untroubled happiness. Here, the entire soul experiences divine things when it is judged worthy of obtaining divine peace. And this peace makes it pass beyond, if we may speak this way, the limits not only of malice and ignorance, of lying and wicked, wickedness, and of vices opposed to virtue, knowledge, truth, and goodness, which exists alongside the natural movements of the soul, but even to the limits of virtue itself, and the knowledge and truth and goodness as we know them, it brings us to rest beyond speech and knowledge in the ultimate truth and goodness of God's embrace in accordance with his unfailing promise so that there is no longer anything at all which can trouble it or cause it any disturbance in the secret recesses in God. It is in this blessed and mo most holy embrace that is that it is accomplished this awesome mystery of a union transcending mind and reason by which God becomes one flesh and one spirit with the church and thus with the soul and the soul with God. O Christ, how shall I marvel at your goodness? I shall not presume to sing praises because I have not enough strength to marvel in, the, in a worthy manner. For they shall be two in one flesh, says the divine apostle. This is the great mystery. I speak of Christ and the church. And he adds, one who cleaves to the Lord is one spirit. Thus, when the soul has become unified in this way and is centered on itself and on God's, there is no reason to divide it on purpose into numerous things because its head is crowned by the first and the only unique word in God. It is in him as 
the creator and maker of beings, that all principles of things both are and subsist as one in an incomprehensible simplicity, gazing with a simple understanding on him who is not outside it, but thoroughly in the whole of reality, it will itself understand the principles of being and the causes why it was distracted by divisive pursuits before being espoused to the word of God. It is by them that it is logically brought safe and sound to him who creates and embraces all principles and causes. Such then, as we have said, are the elements of the soul which spiritually possesses wisdom in potency. From wisdom, it is led to contemplation, whence knowledge. From knowledge, it is led to enduring knowledge, whence truth. Which is the term and the end of all the blessings of the mind. By reason, it possesses prudence. From this, it is led to action. From action to virtue, whence to faith, whereby it rests in the good, which is the blessed term of reasonable activities. Through these science, through these, the science of divine things is acquired from the unifying encounter of these things with each other. It is to all these things that the Holy Church of God clearly adapts itself when likened in contemplation to the soul. By means of the sanctuary, it signifies everything that is manifested as existing in the mind and proceeding from it. By means of the name, it indicates what is shown to exist in the reason and projects from reason. All of these things, it gathers together for the mystery accomplished on the divine altar. Whoever has been fortunate enough to have been spiritually and wisely initiated into what is accomplished in church has rendered his soul divine and a veritable church of God. It is perhaps for this reason that church made by human hands, which is its symbolic copy because of the variety of divine things which are in it has been given to us for our guidance towards the highest good. Okay, so what I want to do is, you know, I know this, that this way of thinking is different than how most people think about these things. So I'm going to try to give you my summary of how Maximus approaches everything. And I want to show you how he's doing that in this piece. In this piece, you can see that there is this person standing in the middle. He's looking up towards the infinite, towards the universal, and he's looking down at the finite and the particular. And he's moving up towards the universal and then down towards the particular. He's moving up towards the infinite and down towards the finite. He's going from wisdom, which is moving up towards universal principles, universal truths, and then using prudence to move towards the good in the here and now, in the life now. That is the pattern of movement. I want to give you a little bit of background on Maximus. Maximus's thinking, entire thinking is Christological. Okay, Christ is the symbol. To him, Christ is a symbol. Now, the symbol word we use very loosely, or and we have forgotten where it came from. Symbol is a Greek word. Ball means to throw. Sim means together. So when he says Christ is a symbol, he means he's the one who is throwing together heaven and earth. He's the one who is throwing together God and man. He's the one who is throwing together 
the infinite and the finite. He's the one who is throwing together the universal and particular. He's the one who is trying to bring heaven down to earth. So he is at, at that verge. That is the meaning of Christ for Maximus. He's saying he's willing to take on all the current forms and he's willing to let them, you know, let all the forms which are dead forms die so that by focusing on the truth, he can create new life. So it is about eternal rebirth, continuous rebirth in the present. And this is what he's talking about. He's saying that you have a faculty, which he calls the rational soul. Um, again, stepping back, you know, Maximus sits on the top of a lot of patristic thinking. One of the key tenets of the patristic psychology, and this is, you know, Maximus's take on it. Maximus is the most Aristotelian. I find that he's the most Aristotelian of, of the church fathers because he brings together the infinite and the finite. He's always trying to make the highest of ideals real. He's trying to take the truth and achieve the good. So he's always going, going, going like that all the time. You know, going from very, very you're standing, going up towards truth, and then down and out towards uh, goodness. Uh, so that's that's the pattern uh, of of his his entire thought of bringing together and making one the the infinite that is the universal principle so your your mind he's saying that the mind is pursuing universal principles something that is true so you're pursuing truth so that you can think of that as science okay i'm going to try to use uh, words different words i don't want to use the same words as his so you can think of it as science and engineering. Engineering is transforming the world. So you're trying to learn the truth in order to transform the world. You have to have fullest commitment to wisdom, to truth, to contemplation in order to get at the truth. And that, and then you have to have prudence, which is shaped by the wisdom. Prudence is your transformation of the world, actually bringing heaven on earth, bringing the true, making it manifested in good life. So he has that movement of going up and going down. And he sees that as being the essence of the world. So this is all about the word. This is all about the power of consciousness. This is all about the power of will that we have. He could, they consider, so coming back to the patristic psychology, they say that animals have passions. Again, passion is a word, the word that we use is based on the Latin derivations. You know, somebody is passionate, but the word, the word passion as the these Greek fathers use is based on the Greek word, which is the same root as passive. So, he, you know, Maximus says that animals have passions. So that means they are they passively react to things. And that is completely innocent and natural part of us as animals and of animals. They feel hunger in reaction to things that enable them to eat. Similarly, they feel fear in response to danger that enables them to save their lives. And all of that is entirely natural and innocent. In addition to that, we have a faculty of focusing on the infinite. 
that is our mind. That is our will. This is the highest. The, when they say that man is created in the image of God, they mean that we have faculties which are God-like. And the core, the, the core faculty that they're talking about is the faculty of will and reason. Now that faculty, when focused on the infinite, about learning to be good, trying to create beauty, or learning the truth, you can infinitely focus on it. And the more you focus on it, the more you more progress you make and the more vistas you see of possibilities. So it is, it offers an infinite. If you're pointed upwards towards heaven, then all of these towards universals, towards truth, then your this faculty that we have for infinite things produces good things. When the same faculty of focusing on the infinite this magnificent faculty, when we turn that downwards towards finite, that causes trouble. Take example of food. If you use your will and your creativity and your reason in order to eat more and more and more and more and become a glutton, that leads to death. That leads, and whether that is food, or anything else, power, wealth, where you're seeking it just for the sake of itself. It can never satisfy you because it is finite. So it is, so they say that this faculty for the infinite, being focused on the infinite and on the finite through the inf infinite. So it's, he's, it's not, as he's pointing out in this entire thing, it's not finite versus infinite, but it is finite through infinite. So infinite has to come first. The principles have to come first. Wisdom has to come first. Only then you can have prudence. Contemplation has to come first. Only then you can have action. Knowledge has to come first through which you will get virtue. Enduring knowledge has to come first, and through that you will have the fullest confidence in your action, which is also called faith. And it is by pursuing truth that you will achieve the good. So that is the pattern of uh, Maximus's thought. All right. So now I would like to open it up for any questions. You know, I this is I want to make this way of thinking um, accessible to people. So firstly, would love uh, to hear any questions or any kind of quick general comments. Do not try to compare him to other people. Just talk about, you know, what struck you about this briefly or, and any questions. So I want to get the dialogue going now. Go ahead and type an exclamation mark if you would like to speak or raise your hand in Zoom. Uh, rocks, go ahead. Oh, just a second. Go ahead. You can unmute yourself now. So first of all, this work is fascinating to me. And I think it's the first work where they talk about the soul being contemplative. Um, and the usage of the word prudence, that a prudent person is not easily deceived. Um, and the constant circling back to the greater good. I mean, there's so much in this dialogue that I find an interesting crossover because more often Christianity doesn't have that universal concept. So, I, yeah, I find this fascinating. So I'm 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 I'm, willing, I'm I'm welcoming to hear everybody's opinion on this because well, it's you. amazing. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. So I want to uh, I want to say that the thing that is. Um, you know, really unique about these church fathers is that they always think in Trinitarian terms. Okay, not just about God, but about man. And not just about man, but about society. Um, what they are saying is that we are beings who have a body, who have a heart, 
and who have a mind. And unless you have all these three things going on in unison, acting together, you will not have anything. And the model there is the trinity of, you know, the, the life being the father, the mind being the son, and love being the Holy Spirit. So you need love, you need understanding, and with that, you can have life. Um, so it is profoundly integrative. See, modern way of thinking is, is fractured. It tries to chop things up um, and, and then create these artificial things because most people are, you know, first, the other part of it is that this is intensely practical. This is intensely practical. He's saying, how do I live? And if whatever I'm saying doesn't speak to that, then I'm not doing anything because you're not talking in order to impress other people. You are using your reason in order to figure out what true, what is true and how to be good. And the effect of that is beauty. Effect of that is beauty. Um, I'm going to give a chance for people who have who are new to speak because it's uh, so. Uh, uh, Joe, if you don't mind, I'm going to go with Peter followed by Joe. Peter, go ahead. From my reading, it appears that <clears throat> he's making an appeal towards the church, right? This idea of the 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 importance of liturgical transformation in order to meld these parts together in acknowledgement. And not merely from a rational discourse such as Aristotelian, but the uh, the kind of uh, Neoplatonist, Iamblichan kind let of me, uh, let uh, let the, me, the, let the, me Yeah, let, let me answer that. Because what I want to do is I want to kind of bring Maximus in. Uh, because, you know, this is a very small piece of his work. He just talks about church. So I want to explain how, because I, I said that, that he's kind of Trinitarian in three ways. He's Trinitarian about God, he's Trinitarian about man, and he's Trinitarian about society. What he's saying is that the idea of church is simply two or three people gathered in his name. So it's basically when you have, when I'm talking to you, there are certain principles that we are taking for granted that about what is true, what is good, and what is beautiful. And that third party, third idea, which is the idea of God, is providing a commonality of interaction for people. So for them, for, for Maximus, church is that. So for example, in this work, what he does is that he looks at the structure of the church. I'm going to modify it slightly based off how he thinks about it. You know, first decision is to actually walk into the church, which is the, you know, your body, you're actually spending time there. The second part of it is the place where all the gospel and all the readings are taking place. So that is ap appealing to your mind. And then the altar on the in the sanctum is really the Holy Spirit, which you are trying to get at. So, so even the church is structured that way. It is structured like body, mind, and heart. Uh, so he's bringing the power and he's saying that um, look, all of us are limited. So for example, if I'm trying to learn, the, for example, what we are doing here in, in 52 Living Ideas is that everybody is trying to learn. And when you have multiple people learning the same thing, there is a commonality. There is, it enables you to be actually speaking about what you know and hearing what the other person is saying enables you to learn faster as a community. So it is point, he's pointing to that a community is built as a result of, of, um, of this. So I don't know whether that, uh, but, but please go on, Peter. There is that sense of when we come together and find a common ground, and create something together. This idea that it is through that unity or contrast or complementary that we uh, um, stimulate ourselves and each other in ways that we wouldn't do alone, right? And thus the basis of those who are in the spirit or intention of 
Christ or truth or whatever to come together and thus have a dance of exchange that allows for the stimulation of the various parts. And liturgy being, say, a, uh, a, a, a scaffolding for that, as opposed to something that's a bit more lively and dynamic or chaotic, such as a, any given conversation with purity in, of intent. And absolutely. So it, it is that sort of sense of what does it mean or what can it mean outside of merely to engage with other people uh, to uh, um, explore these various parts uh, more, let's say, intentionally in relationship to uh, each other for that type of church. Yes, exactly. I mean, uh, what happens is that, you know, most churches, uh, you know, most institutions get ritualized and lose the meaning of what the original meaning was. So that's why I kind of keep going to Gospel of John. You know, it's like the first church, if you want to put it, uh, if you look at the first church in Gospel of John. The first church is Jesus on the Christ uh, on the cross, where he says to Mary, "Behold your son," and says to John, "Behold your mother." That Trinity there is the first church, because the mother is basically the full love, you know, just love that provides the base. The son, he's she, he's not. John is not her biological son. So he is kind of the stand in for Jesus at that point. And Jesus now is God. So it's basically the Holy Spirit, um, the son and, and father on earth. That is what is being kind of portrayed uh, there. Also, like after resurrection, you have got this scene where uh, you know, this is what Gary talks about uh, very well. He says, after resurrection, you know, you expect some fireworks, but what do you see? Is Jesus says to people, come have breakfast. And they're sitting around a fire eating fish. Um, so so there is a, the, the kind of community is actual, genuine, caring about, respecting about, loving people. That is really what the, you know, what the, uh, you know, the idea of the church that is being aimed at. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Next up is Joe followed by Katie. Joe, what do you think of Maximus? I mean, it's an interesting approach. I actually appreciated what you, uh, how you actually depicted it uh, with the interesting um, approach towards science. Uh, because I think that that's actually key to another Aristotelian, which is Aquinas. Yeah. Uh, so uh, let me comment very quickly on that. So what he's using, he actually uses the words divine science and human science. So it's right. like you're trying to, so divine science is what we call science. The human science is what we call engineering. So it's like he's saying that those are integral parts. Please go on. Absolutely. I mean, no. And so that's knowledge, right? And that's knowledge and divine revelation. So that that's essentially what you're getting to. If you're going well, from this idea of understanding, wisdom, and knowledge uh, to this, which is coming through the revelation, which is God. What What do you think, uh, Joe? What, what What did you, uh, do you have any questions about Maximus? Because what I want to do is I uh, want to- well, I, I mean, uh, actually, I, I would say, how does he differ from Aquinas or Aristotle would be a good question. Sure, okay, Let, let's do, I mean, I don't know Aquinas deep enough. The only thing I know of his is Gospel of John, and right. uh, that I'm more kind of biased towards looking at what he's talking about, John, of the material itself. So I've not really spent enough time on Aquinas. Um, the Aristotle, it's actually very simple. For example, Aristotle says that, uh, I, I would say, I mean, the, my, my simple answer to that is that he's more Aristotelian than Aristotle. Aristotle is too much influenced by Plato. Um, you know, the way he thinks about it. This guy is really very deeply Aristotelian in the sense that, firstly, both of them agree that theology is the highest of, of knowledge. So that is the, the same idea of kind of your after truth. That is what, and you have to be after truth. Secondly, you are after truth in order to make, not, not just, you are after truth and you have to make this life better. So both of those. So it, he's saying like, 
yes to the universal and yes to the particular. And he's all about bringing the, you know, bringing heaven down on earth. The, it's the idea of theosis. It is idea of making, you know, moving man towards God. You know, they, they say that, you know, the way in which his church fathers think is that man is created in the image of God. That means we have the faculties, but virtue consists of being God-like. That means taking the actions, taking the, to the, to go towards towards that. All right, uh, go ahead. I would just say I I, I think that there um, the the rational and the contemplative, which you know you you have uh, with Aristotle, you have the vegetative, which is more okay. the idea of desire. Let, let us one thing, Joe. Uh, let's not compare other people right now, let, because okay. what I want to do is I want to just I want the, Maximus is so different from everybody else. That yes. I want, I want you and everybody to get. He is what Aristotelian, he is, he is Aristotelian. He, he's much more than that. He's much, much more than that. Uh, so, for example, like the, the place where he is more, I think, is that firstly he's far more intense. So he will talk about what is happening now, in a way which is completely mind blowing, and that is really, you know, kind of Christ on the cross. That is the idea that you have to be willing to give up your ideas in order to go, go to the next level. In that sense, Aristotle is platonic. He thinks those ideas are kind of fixed in some way. Um, he So he, the dynamism that he has is much, 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 much greater. The second thing is that his insights about psychology are far deep, far deeper. Um, Thirdly, he has this entire tradition, which is there in the Indian context of concentration of spirituality, which just infuses his thought. So he's much higher in in my books than than Aristotle. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with. I mean, a sense that it's a um, it's a deeper relationship with the essence of uh, of God. Um, but there, there are some. I, I would just say some similarities between the idea of combining reason and contemplation and the search for knowledge, and that the idea that we're curious individuals by nature. That's which is Arist Aristotle, is that you know that leads to purpose, right? Absolutely. And the yeah. seeking of knowledge and the seeking of truth. So that this uh, there's this reason and this contemplative that actually still absolutely exists in Aristotle. Like that's one of the distinctions. Yes. Like, Absolutely. No, I completely agree. What I'm saying is that he is Aristotelian, but he goes much, 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 much beyond Aristotle. Partly he stands when he's standing on Aristotle's shoulders. Right. He knows Aristotle really, really well. And he's standing on the shoulders, but he's integrating Aristotle with what is there in Gospel of John, which is something more, something addition. The concept of will is a very powerful concept. And the way in which it is explicated in Christianity is much higher. And that is the core of our being, core of the choice of that we have. Understanding that is crucial. Go ahead. That's, I think you actually just nailed it. So the distinction I would say between Aristotle and 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 uh, Catholicism and religious and in particular is the equal um, the you're giving equal credence to both the will and the intellect. So the, whereas Aristotle gives more credence to the intellect. No, um, would, it, which would be more the concrete, more the uh, you know the, more the concrete, so to speak. Right. I mean, what he does, he doesn't understand will. He doesn't understand will. And these guys understand. Aristotle, will. Doesn't, understand will. Aristotle doesn't understand will. And these guys understand will. And they know that the will and intellect is one and the same. Mm -hmm. It's the word. It's the word on the cross. That is the will and intellect at the same time. This is a completely different view. I mean, and it goes to the heart of our volition of what we can control. And that point, if somebody nails that point, that's like the point of maximum leverage. It's like, are you going to 
give up your emotions, your ideas right now in order to be open to something which is true, which is new. That is the that is the thing that we are faced with at all times. Are we going to keep doing? Are we going to do something which is comfortable, or are we going to do that? And that's that that the that's right. word in us. Now, if you nail that, I mean, yes, he's Aristotelian, but that's the base, and he goes much, 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 much further. That's why I want, and most people do not have him. Because the what has happened is that Christianity has become more Roman. Uh, you know, the Western Christianity is more Roman because it is focused on the organization of the church in case of, so an, another way of putting it is that they're, is they're focused on the body a lot. Or there is a rebellion against the body and then there is Holy Spirit, which is a lot of kind of some of the, you know, you know the the rebellion against the, uh, the the catholic church was that look we are losing the holy spirit and it is true but then if you pursue the holy spirit without the father and the son it is no longer holy because holy means it's whole it it is basically when love comes based on truth and goodness then the beauty that follows from it is holy, is one whole. What these guys are doing, what John does very well, um, is that, that integration. And that integration is very profound. It's very profound. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Joe. Next up is going to be Katie, Maritza, and Olympia. Katie. Katie, are you there? Uh, maybe she's still stepped away. Uh, just a second. What happened? Try it again. Uh, Katie, you should be able to unmute. Okay. Uh, let's uh, let's go with Maritza. Maritza, go ahead, and then we'll go to Katie. Katie, go ahead, Maritza. What's going on? Oh, okay. There I go. Can you hear me? Okay, yes, yes. Oh, sorry about that. All right, it took a minute for a second. Um, so, you know, this is, uh, so this is my first, my first introduction to Maximus. I'm not previously familiar. And I have to say it's what struck me most, and you asked earlier on what like our initial thoughts, mine was that I have never seen the word reason used so often in a Christian text. Um, that was the very first thing that struck me. Um, and I really appreciated the tie in. It wasn't just mentioned, it was defined, described, and integrated into what was being said. And so that it was that that was like highly enticing to me. I, I really liked the the idea that, the mind is ever moving towards truth. And he equates truth with God, but uh, you know, I, I'm always looking at ways for um, religious texts to be more universal. And it's so easy to see here, the idea of it's, you know, you're moving towards truth, you're moving towards God, the spiritual. And I, I really appreciate that what's being saying here is that it cannot be done by skipping over these certain steps. Like, you know, he talks about, um, and I might miss one because, you know, like I said, I'm kind of new to it. So the knowledge and contemplation and habit, I think he thinks talks about habit. And I just, and it, and it he re repeats the same phrase. Like it's, it's actually funny. The first time I was listening, I was actually listening to you, your reading and I wasn't following along with words and I had to stop and go to the words because I actually thought I'd missed something because it sounded like it was repeating. And I was like, oh, did it skip? But he actually, throughout the entire chapter, he repeats the same phrase of walking you through what flows from what. And I, I just thought that that was, a, that's also really 
really good writing. If you're writing to someone and you're trying or to to a community of people and the goal is to put out a message, I, I think that's a brilliant way of kind of solidifying in one's mind. Um, and another, the other word that stuck out to me here, um, Shikant, is concretization. You know, it's not a common word. We have come across it once before, you and I together, but, um, and, and it's struck us kind of the same way. And, you know, I know we're not trying to make comparisons, so I'm going to refrain from those comments till later, but um, I just, to me, when I hear that word, I hear a teacher, philosopher, whoever, I hear a teacher attempting to take concepts and bring them down to earth, bring them down and place them with glue so that they can become part of the everyday. And so I really, I really appreciated that. And, and sorry if these are kind of broad comments, but I, I just, you know, the, um, like I said, I'm I'm new, so I don't have but so much. This is excellent, to, Marissa. So this is like, fantastic because you you actually captured, you actually got the heart of what he's doing. That's exactly what he's doing, and that's why I like him so much because that's, and this is not an unusual thing. This is what he does throughout. That's oh, amazing. Higher work, because he's really trying to understand who we are as human beings, and what should we be doing. And what is the role of mind in that? And what is the role of body or actions? And what is the role of our heart? And he's going all, you know, it's like, it's a Trinitarian. It's like he's moving from, yeah. because here, you, you know, the focus remains on like body and mind. This is, this is Christ. This is like divine is God and man is, so he's both man and God. So he's, and God here simply means, universal, eternal. So mm -hmm. he's focusing on the universal. So he never loses focus on that. He's always talking to the universal. And he will, but he doesn't just talk to the universal. He loves people. And he's so, so he's taking, going to the universal in order to go to the people. So it's like, it's like this. And then he wants people to come to him. So what, what, what it is, is that he's, it's like, and that, that is part of the, that actually completes the, 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 the triangle of love. Because you're saying, you know what? That action of, it's like it's being, it is skin in the game. You know, he's putting skin in the game. He's saying, I will do whatever is needed to make things, make things good. And I will pay the price now um, in my mind, in my body, in my emotions now, in order to do, to move towards truth, goodness and beauty. Go ahead, uh, Marissa. Yeah, um, you know, and, and you can see that it's the, th that's interesting you say that because I, that's visible in the writing. It's the, it's almost like there's sections where he's saying these things I have learned to be truth and I'm sharing with you. And then he goes back and he's asking a question and it does seem to be going in a loop. And it's, it's kind of interesting. I, it's a very, a, approachable way to some really deep concepts um at least to me and i there it's a different way of stating also this idea of knowledge and wisdom and it's refreshing to see someone whose base is spiritual actually saying no the base is knowledge and i it's you know it Sometimes it seems that those two are put as adversaries. So it's fascinating and refreshing to see that th there are these very old works saying, no, it doesn't need to be. And let me explain how we get there. Cause that's what it seems. The, his, his, it, re, his um, repeating um, thing of, you know, how contemplation flows into knowledge and flows into wisdom it paints the picture that we don't have to choose one. In fact, we are not whole if we choose one. We will most benefit from embracing all three, which I, and it's something you were, you were saying earlier. And um, 
it, I, I can totally see, it's funny because he doesn't actually say that explicitly, but when you were saying it and giving us in your own words, thank you, but for the way, for using different words, because it, it helps kind of as a check to see, oh, wait, yes. Okay. I, I did understand that it wasn't stated that way, but when you say it, it, I can make the dots. So it, it makes sense. Yeah. So thank you for this. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. And um, the thing that is hallmark of this approach is an integrated approach. I mean, this is the same thing that you find in like Gospel of John, find it in Bhagavad Gita, you find it in uh, in Tao Te Ching. So in Bhagavad Gita, it is Bhakti Yoga, Karma Yoga, and Jnana Yoga. Jnana Yoga is pursuit of knowledge. Karma Yoga is pursuit of goodness. And Bhakti Yoga is pursuit of love of God. So you have this three-part division and you are all focused on that. Dhyana Yoga is, you know, keep your attention on this three things. Uh, and it is a trinity. You know, it's like, it's not, these are not separate. Like when you know more, you are actually better at doing things, doing the right things. And when you're doing the right things, you are full of love. Uh, and if you're full of love, then you're going to understand things even better. And so it's like it's and so it's like in some ways you're seeing he's going round and round, but it's a spiral because it is going closer to the truth. And the truth is one. So the word holy and whole is the same, has the same root. You know, you're trying to capture the whole, whole of your being, whole of your being as one person, whole of your being as what exists. You know, these you can talk about, you know, truth, goodness, beauty. And you can call them universals, or you can call them, you know, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's, that's two different ways of thinking about the same thing, which is universal, which it, which ap applies to everything, which is there in everything. And you're saying that you are in the image of that. So you're trying to make your mind, your body, and your emotions, in, in and your heart, in the emotion, in the image of that. And then the most beautiful thing is that the same thing is happening between people. So when you are talking to one another, right? You are, if somebody is talking, you are listening with an open heart. That means you are trying to take in what is being said and you're trying to always check it against the truth, against the reality. So reality is there, over there. And then when you are speaking, the other person is listening with an open heart. So you have this kind of trinity of interaction going on between people or between you and a group of people. It's the same thing. But that is profoundly integrative way of, of thinking, which is which actually is there throughout his work, you know, in everything that he's doing. So thank you, Maritza. I'm I'm glad that you came and this is, I think, uh, it, I think you 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 summarized it very well. All right, uh, let's see what's happening with Katie. Katie can't unmute, so I will type into chat. We associate soul more with body in modern mindset. I picture immaterial body when I think of the soul rather than the soul as mind. Yeah, so the thing is that you have to keep aside, like I think the modern way of thinking about things is highly fractured. You know, they're always thinking about soul versus the body. Here, what he's saying is that the spirit and flesh is brought together by the mind. So you're pursuing the spirit in pursuing the truth and you're pursuing the physical well-being when you're pursuing in this direction. And he, which is personification of the mind, you know, he's the word. <laughs> You know, that's what, that's what it is. His entire thing that, you know, uh, Maritza, the point that you're making that, you know, this is really, a, he's talking a lot about reason. That's all he talks about. That is his entire view. He's saying everything is made through these principles and you have to understand the principle. He has this entire terminology. He's saying he's the logos and each person has a logoi, which is like the essence of the person, the function in the person. And Things go wrong when the logoi, which is the function within you, 
the form is not according to the function. So we can put the same thing in terms of, you know, form follows function. All right, next up is Olympia. Olympia, go ahead. What do you think? I know that you know, you are familiar with Maximus, so tell me. Well, so here's two things. I would like to go back to Joe and actually comment a little bit on Aristoteles versus Maximus. So Aristoteles seems to be more based on logic and that is the reasoning. So that one side, um, only one side of the mind, which is the reasoning, but then as we can see, the mind is also the manifestation of the soul. So there is the righteousness and uh, the will that comes with the mind as well, aside from just the reasoning. And I think that's the point that Aristoteles is missing to a certain extent. And Maximum seems to integrate the two into the word. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Olympia. Uh, Joe, go ahead. Folks, go ahead and type an exclamation mark. Would love to hear what you thought of Maximus and if you have any questions. Uh, Joe, go ahead. I mean, I from what I, and again, I'm not an Aristotelian scholar, but uh, um, he does believe in beyond uh, things beyond the sensorial perception. So there, there is that element of it. So it's not purely rational. I wouldn't necessarily say that. I would say that he, in Maximus is, does actually focus on the idea of uh, grace, which is, uh, you know, specific to to belief in in, in God, uh, which is specific to uh, um, also incorporating uh, reason with grace. So it's 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 a combination of the two. But I wouldn't say that Aristotle is necessarily totally, uh, you know, totally ignores the idea. In fact, actually, uh, he. That's the higher level ideals that he says we're able contemplating and actually managing ourselves towards, and that's ethics. And that's the ethics of virtue, and that's where you're kind of guiding yourself towards truth. And so that idea of knowledge as well. So I, I think there, there may be more, absolutely more, uh, um, uh, you know, emphasis on the idea of will, but and grace. But I wouldn't say it's absolute. Sure. No, that's that's a good point. Um, Peter, go ahead. Uh, to quote, <clears throat> thus, when the soul has become unified in this way and is centered on itself and on God's, there is no reason to divide it on purpose into numerous things because its head is crowned by the first and only unique word and God. To me, that relationship of the it can easy at the first grant the suspension of the intellect, that which is discursive thought and uh, discernment in the splitting of things into many things. That aspect of what is the true rest of mind rather than its paralysis in regards to having found the good and found that it is all and one. Therefore, there is no, there's no compulsion or need for the mind to split things again because that is an activity, so it can then truly rest. Very good, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, wonderful, so uh, let's see. Uh, any further comments, anybody? Um, Judy, go ahead, what did you think? Very curious to hear what you, what you, what you thought of this. I have to say that I was lost in, in the dogma part, um, but then I started, circling each one of the truths that you mentioned, mind, reason, wisdom, and I did like a mandala. So when I saw it in a visual form, I saw 12 circles and it, it just illuminated that everything is connected. So I saw the Holy Spirit and I saw so many other uh, uh, truths that all of you have been talking about today in a, in a more cohesive way when I started seeing it all interconnected in a visual format. So I just wanted to say that, um, that, it, that it's really, it's really, I had no idea because I am not a scholar at all on anything that has to do with uh, Christian dogma. And um, 
but I'm I'm super interested in in what everybody is thinking, and uh, this is so so stimulating. So I'm I'm eager to know more right now. So thank you. That's basically thank you. what. Uh, yeah, Judy, can you do us a favor and can you show me show us the mandala? Sure. It's uh, I don't know if you can see it. It's more of a sketch than anything else. Yeah. And each number means each one. Like number one, it's the first one that you mentioned which is uh, moral. Yep. And number two is, I mean, first is the mind, then re two is reason, three is wisdom, four is prudence, um, five is contemplation, six is action, seven is knowledge, eight is virtue, nine is enduring knowledge, and uh, nine is um, faith, or 10 is faith, 11 is truth, and 12 is goodness. Wonderful. So, Thank I don't you. know if you can see it really well, Thank but it, it just it just made made sense to me when I saw it all interrelated. Thank you, uh, thank you. Um, so there are, um, when firstly I I really like this way. I, mean, I I also can I have to draw things, mm -hmm. uh, in order to understand them because really you're trying to see a relationship. So, uh, I've been looking at um, you know, is it, I mean, if you want to look at. Um, you know, when I when I think about Christianity, it's basically like a couple of main ideas. You know, the core idea is that of of Christ and the idea of Trinity. So mm -hmm. Christ, that is incarnation, which includes I mean, the Christ on the cross. I did a presentation on the uh, Paschal mystery. Um, mm -hmm. Where you know you have the the thing about. Uh, so I was thinking about, you know, kind of Christ on one hand, which is a core idea of Christianity and Trinity, which is also a core idea. And what is the relationship between the two? Right. So Christ is the mediator, is the middle point between God and man. Okay. Mm -hmm. Think of it this way. He's also the middle point between um, the Holy Spirit and the Father. And so Christ remains the same. Um, so you can take keep that point the same and you can and Christ is the word. Mm -hmm. So he's all about the mind. He's about consciousness in the present. He is will. So it's really that aspect of him. It's that I will. I will do the right thing. Mm -hmm. I will focus on the right thing now at whatever price to exactly. my that is really the heart of it and he is in the middle because he is he brings together with mind he's in the middle with mind yeah and then, exactly. yeah and then the last one is number 12 which is uh goodness and um i think that is is the application of it all when you start applying things so to reality. Yes. I mean, the, the way in which, um, you know, many philosophers have thought about it is, is the, you know, is the triad of truth, goodness, and beauty. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the profoundness of the image of Christ is that he is goodness, really. I mean, mm -hmm. there is, the beauty is really the Holy Spirit. Yes. It's love and beauty is yeah. what the Holy Spirit is about. It's the result. You know, there are people who want that, but if you want that, you really need all the all three things. Oh, otherwise, yeah. otherwise, it's not holy. It's a spirit, but it's not holy. Uh, so if so, you have that, but you have the truth, goodness, and beauty. Truth is the Father. Goodness is the Son. And what, what is the goodness? Good, you know, that is a moral thing you know being able to distinguish between good and bad and be able to conquer conquer the the bad in order to regenerate the good in the moment all the time that right. action that moral action is what it is and it's the same action of the mind you know it is the pursuit of truth giving up what your preconceived ideas is in order to go towards the truth all the time. So that aspect, it is the heart of will. So thank you. Thank you so much. Next Very up is Joe. Joe, go ahead. 
I really like what you just said with giving up your preconceived notions as, as uh, yeah, I mean, that's, um, yeah, that's a, that's an important thing to, 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 to comprehend. Um, just a really quick question. I, you know, um, mind is contemplation. Is it not an action? Or no, he's, action? He's, no, that, he's, I thought action was reason and mind is contemplation. Is that, is that incorrect? He is saying that the faculty, the rational faculty, what he's saying is that there are two things that he's talking about. Both are there in Christ. Right. In the person. So wisdom, what he's saying is that wisdom and prudence, mind and reason, focus on the universal and focus on the particular is one thing. I thought it was action and reason. That's why uh, that was where I was. No, it's, it's mind and reason and contemplation and action. So he's saying, there is really contemplation is nothing if you no, don't have action. Action is nothing if you don't have contemplation. It's all one. That is the idea of Christ. See, this is very different from modern way of thinking. You know, this is like saying, what is the heart of things? And that is all he's focused on. And that's the greatness of it. Because the thing is that you can always take one of these things and talk about it, as most people do. But then you don't have the whole. The, the, the beautiful thing that he's doing is that he's bringing, you know, he's showing you a holistic way of thinking, a way of thinking where you're taking into account everything at the same time. No, no, I mean, I, you know, I assume what you mean. It's, I mean, I do see the, the mind action and how that relates to truth. Uh, I mean, how that leads to truth. Uh, you know, the, the it, action. It leads to two things at once. It it leads to truth on the higher side and goodness on the, so you will have truth and goodness. So if you're right. doing things right, yeah. all of these kind of, what his entire point is to, he's actually opening up and showing you all the causality. And then he's showing you that it's all one. Mm -hmm. That is the whole point, you know, of, of seeing the oneness. Um, so it's a very profound, profound way of thinking. And that is um, that that is really the heart of what what is being presented uh, in in you know Gospel of John. You know he's basically it's you know his his predecessors are uh, John, and then Gregory of Nazianzus uh, is is a very key figure, um, but he takes it uh, the thing that he adds, which for example Gregory has to some extent. Uh, John has a lot of this, but is that he has actual experience. You know, he brings in the beauty and the emotional power of when you're doing things right. So it is not dry. It is not, um, you know, it has all these three qualities of the most intense emotions, most profound thought, and most effective action in, in, in one. Um, Let's go to Peter and then uh, Joe. Peter, go ahead. I would like to read the uh, the first two sentences in relationship to my interpretation of what he means by reason. Sure. And I quote, And he used to teach that it is not only the whole of man that is, is composed of body and soul joined together, that God's only hurt, holy church can be an image, but also the soul considered in itself by reason. So what does he mean by reason? For said he, the soul in general consists of an intellectual and a vital faculty. The former, the intellectual, uh, moved freely according to its will. The latter, the vital faculty, uh, remains remaining without choice in accordance with nature. So this idea of the vital force is without choice because it goes in accordance to, with nature. Uh, it is not something that the uh, the will can uh, make a choice uh, for directly. So this idea of accepting the vital force as something that is beyond your control. Let's say the animal mind, let's say, that we can respond to it, but we cannot directly control it. And so therein lies, for my opinion, this idea of the importance of compassion for, let's say, the animal vital force that is within us within everyone else, thus allowing for forgiveness, mercy, for this idea of the limits of self-control in regards, because self-control can never be perfect in that sense. There is only relating to the vital force in a way that is, uh, makes it uh, compatible together as, as as a team instead of an endless war. Uh, but I digress. Um, 
in the this idea of let, and let me go ahead and comment on this one yeah. and then you can uh yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. um so actually i'm glad that you brought up this quote okay so what he's saying is that there has to be this acceptance of what is okay so almost like acceptance of reality acceptance of god and that's what he has when he's talking to talking to his talking to his father he, that's what he has he has full acceptance of what is okay and he has the full exercise of will both together so this is really it's a, it's a view of reason this is basically science of saying accept what is and do your best use your will to understand it so it's having both together acceptance so this is like the dichotomy of control right there okay of saying yes to reality yes to nature and saying yes to the will in the context of that it is not will where you'll say okay i'll do whatever i feel like no 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 this is will after having accepted what is so that is really the heart of kind of you know this is like science you know this is like saying i will try to understand things but what is is and i will never put my will or any of the products of my will above what is go ahead peter to add to that this idea of prudence is a means of the balance in relationship to the natural forces what is hunger there's the libido. What are all these other things that we seek for comfort? We then go to excess or diminishment in relationship to sin because the animal mind doesn't know any better as of yet. So therefore, prudence is this idea of what does it mean to give satisfaction to these parts of ourselves without it leading to greater harm of what is the excess of, uh, you know, the, the seven deadly sins as being going too far in one direction of the primary passions which we sit which we all have. And so therefore the wisdom of knowing how to satisfy them in a way that is well, wise. But to continue, uh, for he said he, the soul in general consists of an intellect, um, and the contemplative, the contemplative power belongs to the intellectual faculty and the active power uh, belongs to the vital faculty. Um, the active, uh, the contemplative power is, is used to call mind the active power reason. So this idea of the vital force being the active power, uh, the yang, uh, the sets, that the compulsion to movement that can be blind or can we can help teach it. Um, but it is this idea that this compulsion towards movement, the active power, the vital power, that is without choice, it is called reason because it does lean towards logic because it ultimately forever strategizes to, in order to satisfy itself. But it is through contemplation, the meta uh, uh, dynamic relationship to reason that we can then guide the impulse to reason to that which is the higher forms. That's not merely the satisfaction of the body, but towards the higher and deeper satisfactions of the soul. Wonderful, beautifully put, thank you. Um, so what, what he's saying, this is really, really good. What he's saying is that, you know, we have capacity of transforming the world. We have that capacity, but that needs to be guided by wisdom. So we, the prudence has to be guided by, by wisdom. You, um, the, um, the animals, and he, he is very, very explicit about the, the animal uh, things is very, very good. It's like, if you see animals in their natural environment, they actually do pretty well. They know they, their faculties of, of the, the passive faculties operate very, very well in their natural environment to support themselves. And those are all innocent uh, and, and given. Now, it's, it's when you have, but we are something which is higher than animals because our transformative power is much, 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 much higher. And for that, we have to use this, you know, the, the universal principles of saying, what is right? What is true? What is beautiful? And then that to guide this one. So thank you so much, Peter. Next up is Joe. Yeah, I just want to actually, you know, I mean, Bill, I, I really appreciated you, the, 
distinguishing is like, but it's outside or not the dichotomy of control, so to speak, um, because I that that does relate directly with the text and the idea of what perfect knowledge is. It doesn't exist outside of God. And that's an important point. That's where is the constant seeking is the eternal. And that's where you're constantly seeking towards God, but you're never going to be God. So that's an important distinction to be able to make. What's outside your control then is 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 exactly that, is the ability to know everything. And so I, I, I um, you know, that distinction is, it's important because you're right, because sometimes in, 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 uh, in, in modern terms, we do think we understand the whole. Let, let me let me go ahead and um, uh, talk about kind of theology. There are like three, four different positions on theology on this. Like one is the, that of Plato, Platonism, which says, look, there is the high, there is the universal, and there is the particular, never the twin shall meet. Okay, so you're saying, okay, we are we are horrible creatures because of earth, the earth is bad, everything good is there in the form. So there is this inseparable two worlds kind of view. Then there is the view, which is the pantheistic view. You're saying, oh, infinite is finite. You can be finite. You can be God. Okay. So that is, you know, that there is only one. What this view is, is that there is infinite, which is the source from which lots of finite things are created. So the way in which Maximus puts it, um, or these church fathers put it, especially in the Orthodox tradition, is that there is the essence of God, which is the core from which everything is coming. That has the infinite potentialities. That is something that we can't get at. But it produces energies of God, all of creation. So for example, you know, Maximus's thing uh, is that if you want to go towards God first, understand the world. Okay, because the world is created by God. The universal principle is created. First step in understanding God is to understand the world. Okay. Understand the principles that are operating in the world. And then slowly you can go towards the higher principles. So it's a very inductive kind of approach. It is saying it's one system. It is one system. You can't get at the source. You are not the source. You know, so it's not a pantheistic view. It is a view where you say that you can, you have the same kind of faculties. So you have the capacity of pursuing the infinite, infinitely, and you keep doing that, but there will always be more. And actually the experience that, uh, you know, kind of I have from studying all of this is that the more you know, the more you realize how much more there is. And it's like, it's like an infinite, it's the same thing with a scientist. Like scientists like Newton at the end of his life would say, you know, everybody's saying, oh, Newton has figured out everything. And now thanks to Newton, we have figured out everything. Who needs anything else? Okay. But his entire approach, you know, for me, I'm just like a kid on the ocean who just discovered that one shell is shinier than the other, whereas the entire ocean remains undiscovered. This is at the end of his life. Okay, and that is exactly the kind of approach of saying reality is what it is. What I have is some understanding of reality, but there is so much more. Yeah, you know, that was an example. I mean, that was a good example. And just to build on that, that was where I started, that the idea that science is a body of knowledge, but it's not the whole. So that this is, and this is where, where is then knowledge found? It's derived from divine revelation in this particular case. And that, the, it, that it, 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 it's essentially uh, through first principles, as you were just saying, right? Or no? Very different. It's very different, uh, Joe. I mean, I, I strongly recommend reading Maximus. He's so much more powerful than the terminology that we are using. First, Because I'm just trying to put it no, into... It's it's better to just read him perfect. directly. Better to read him directly because he thinks about all of these things very differently. And you you will be completely blown away. So uh, the thing I would recommend is Ambiguo Seven, uh, Ambiguo to Thomas Seven. That's his best work. Uh, it's a place where he brings everything together. Uh, Mystagogy is very good. The the link that I have put in, you can read the whole thing where he's see, showing you like the the parallelness. So his way of thinking about it is so much better than the modern terminology. 
than no, that I was just using the term they use. That's all. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's so I I I recommend I'm just going back. Let's go to uh Evanique followed by Maritza. Evanique, what do you think? Uh what do I think? It's all very deep and um a lot of it did go over my head. Mm -hmm. But uh one thing that um was brought up when you said the first step in understanding God is to understand the world. And I think that's so different from Western Christianity, whereas it Western Christianity has you either deny the world well both well it should, I should say both it has you either denying the world or converting the world to Christ but how can you convert the world and the people in it to Christ if you don't understand the world and I think that's so true but to understand the world and to understand God is to understand the world is completely a new way of thinking, I think, because you got to understand that the world is God's creation. So if you understand the creation, you get a better understanding of the creator with the caveat that um, you'll never fully understand God or you'll never understand the universe fully, but the constant pursuit of it, of understanding the world and understanding God will get you closer to that, to a higher power, or since we're talking about Christianity, God, like that gets you closer to God, which is totally different than the Western Christianity would have you separate yourself from the world itself. So that that's what I wanted to add. Exactly, exactly. I mean, this is, this view is very much this worldly view. It says, I mean, it's, it begins by saying, God so loved the world. So like if if you don't love the world, I mean, what 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 are you doing? You know, you you have no chance at all if you don't love the world, and it goes up from there, and this includes everything in the world, and it includes people, and that's completely consistent with what what is being said here, because it's saying that it's simply, you know, God, you know, God's. It, it, it regards the world as God's energy and the center as being God's essence. So it is just, and it's saying it's just one system. So you really need, and what you want to do is that you want that energy to be flowing through you. So if you want to look at it in terms of, uh, you know, form and function, you know, he's saying, he's saying that the function is God. Okay. And the form is everything that is made, which is in a creative, in a way which is consistent with it. And I used to always think, you know, form and form follows function. So there are two things, but actually there are three. There is function, there is form, and there is follows. Okay, what is this follows? Follows means that you have to be alive to the function. Okay, the function is where the truth is, where the wisdom is, where the contemplation is. And forms are where the prudence is, where the goodness is, where the transformation of the world is. And what you're doing is that you're following the function. So that means you are taking the wisdom and you're making it real in the world. You're taking the truth and building goodness in the world. So that integration, that follow is what this entire idea of wisdom or Christ or word is. That is the mind, which is taking the heart, which is the function and transforming it into the body, which is the form. And form follows function. So the function, the follows, which is a verb, is ready to give up whatever forms that are not consistent with the function so that the function can be born again. So that is the idea. That is the idea of the cross. So form follows function is exactly the idea that is being talked about here. On that note, Maritza. Oh, man. Um, okay. I need to process that, but before I comment on that, I'm going to go, I'd like to go back um, a few minutes and um, 
kind of talk about the concept of prudence. Um, so Peter brought it up and you expanded. And, you know, in, in this section that you read, th there's a line that says prudence is the potency of reason. And that reason is prudence in potency. And um, that it's, you know, as you guys were talking, it brought that line back to mind because I, I just thought it was a unique way to to bring prudence in and kind of shine a light on its um, importance. And I had never before considered that that's an excellent way to consider reason. Like it's what is reason other than our actively exercising moderation as it were. Um, and so that's a, it's a, a very eloquent way to state that. Um, and I, I really like the idea that, you know, it's talking, he says that it's God who is the good at which every potency of every reason is meant to end. And if we remember that he has also equated God to truth, it paints for me the image, this constant upward flow towards truth. Um, and, you know, as you've said, even in the universals, and I, I think that we don't, sometimes in, you know, philosophical works, religious works, the concept of interweaving all these facets together being the best way to achieving prudence or moderation, I think that gets lost sometimes. So it's it's really neat to see it here. And I, I really appreciate um, the um, interaction between Peter and you, where you guys were talking a little bit about uh, prudence and how that brings us back to the concept of, you know, you have to embrace the whole, you have to, and, and it helps me also to embrace the comment you said, where you said, this is just as basically science. This is the approach that one takes. Cause you know, at first I was like, hmm, does it? I, I don't know if I entirely see that, but your interaction and bringing out of this helps to solidify that for me because it gives the idea of it's this, you know, it's actively choosing to move forward with prudence. And so, I don't know, I, that's what I'm getting out of that. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And I strongly recommend just like Peter is doing or Marisa is doing, just focus on the text, see what it is saying and let it speak to you instead of saying, oh, this is similar to that. Then you're focused mostly on things that you know you know, just commune with the text to see what he's saying. And you can just pick any random line and it will have, it will have, because he's actually coming from a very different perspective than most of us. And you need to let that speak to you uh, in order to get the maximum value. Uh, next up is Peter. Peter, go ahead. I suppose I wanted to quote the line, and I quote, gazing with a simple understanding on him who is not outside it, but thoroughly in the whole of reality. And so this idea of relating to the infinite, to God, as being not what we like or think is good of reality, but the whole of reality, as we move towards the good, from what we deem the bad. But as such, therein lies the movement of the Son towards the Father. But at the same time, what does it mean to see God in the whole of reality as one relationship to all phenomena, to everything that is, is a manifestation from, instead of the division of good and evil and the fruit of which, which I'm not going here whether that's good or bad, but what does it mean for at least the mind to entertain the idea that the intelligence of God, the spirit of God, is not more one place than another, but equally everywhere. And so to meditate, reflect, and uh, uh, explore the value of that wholeness. Wonderful, thank you, thank you. Um, I was, don't know who, who it was. I, I was reading this story from the Indian tradition. Uh, there was this one famous saint um, who was um, going around 
is trying to find this one person and he goes into a temple and there is this man who is sleeping with his legs on the Shiva Linga. So the, this is like the, the symbol of Shiva and he's putting his foot on it and has gone to sleep. So this guy is very angry. You know, he's, he's a devotee of Shiva and he says, what are you doing? You're putting your foot on God. And the guy says, okay, you can take my foot off and put it where there is no God. And that was really kind of the transformative moment for this particular saint because he, he, has, he had found his, his teacher uh, whom he was actually looking for. But it's a, it's, it is the thing about ritual versus reality. It is seeing the truth in nature itself, in reality itself uh, as, a, as a whole. Um, and the, the thing that is particularly powerful about Christianity uh, to me is that you have this figure of Christ. I think it he concentrates everything. So firstly, he's the verge, you know, he's at the verge of everything. He's the symbol. So it's like there are all these, he's taking on death and he's creating life out of that. He's also like, um, I mean, you can see this in Orthodox churches. Like Orthodox churches, you have the sanctum in the at the back, which is like, just like the essence where the essence is supposed to be. This is, again, this is how Maximus is way of thinking. So, where how, how do you think of trinity okay um because trinity is a crucial idea here because this is the idea through which all these things are integrated so god and actually i'm going to do a presentation on trinity on friday so i'm really looking forward to that because I, I find that it's really core you can't, really can't understand much uh without that um so i want to show you how and this is Exactly the orthodox way of thinking. This is Maximus's way of thinking. Um, I've read so many people that I forget whom I got this from. But you can think of God the Father as from whom everything comes. He's like the source. Source of everything. Okay. Imagine like a sun. Uh, S-U-N. From which everything is coming. Okay. God the Son, that is Christ, is like a lens. You know, he's like the icons that you have you know, this stained glass icons that concentrate the light. You can't see the sun itself. You know, you don't have eyes to see the sun. But this beautiful icon actually shows you the nature of the source in a form which is human, which actually you interact with as a human, you can interact with as a human being. So he, the, the way they put it is that Son is through whom. So you learn through whom. So it is the means by which. It's the mind. It's the word through which you learn. And then the Holy Spirit is in whom. So it's like the illumination in the church. The, you know, the, the fact that everything is lit up. The warmth of the sun. The love. Uh, the grace. That's all kind of the result of, of those uh, three things. But uh, thank you. Um, next up is uh, Joe. Joe, go ahead. Yeah, so maybe I, yeah, coming back to the text, uh, you know, the mind he used to say arise at contemplation when it is it moved by wisdom, by contemplation to knowledge, by knowledge to enduring knowledge, by enduring knowledge to truth. Uh, so that, you know, that idea is central actually uh, to the, you know, what the theological virtues are. I mean, essentially what, you're having to do is put faith in the idea that truth has been revealed and that it's your relationship with God and that constantly moving towards God is that is the um uh that's that is what is revealing what is good what is right and so this is, a, and this is where it's interesting because he writes a little bit later on, faith without actions, I believe, or something along that is dead. You know, so it's worthless. 
So this is the idea that not only you're, you're moving actively moving towards God, but you do have to believe fundamentally that truth has been revealed. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, he thinks exactly opposite of this. So the idea of idea of faith that most people have in in you know in Christianity today, this idea of faith is very different. It's exactly opposite. What he's saying is that just as wisdom comes, just as you have to have wisdom and then you have prudence, just as if you have knowledge, you can have virtue. When you have enduring knowledge, you will have faith. It is a result. And it is something where you have tremendous confidence through your virtue, through your successful action, that what you are doing is right. It is underpinned. It is not. See, it is very simple. What happens is that lots of thought. See, it is the three things. There is the Holy Spirit. There is the word. And there is God the Father. God the Father is life. Okay. The God the Son is thinking the mind. Faith is, is of the heart. Maximus is, is Christocentric. He puts Christ right, you know, he puts word, reason, everything in. So it is like it is when they would say, how to put it? See, it's not, it is like, it is the result of the economy, the, the, the word that I would use, the way he uses faith, it is complete doubtless confidence as a result of all the thinking you've done, all the experience you have had in goodness and all everything that you know about everything after having looked at everything, the confidence that you have. That's a tremendous value. It's it's a, that kind of a thing because he is always focused on the mind. So again and again, basically you have to go back to how he is thinking about right. it. You take the word, usually it means very different from what, you know, in, in the modern context, it means very different. Yeah, I mean, because though ultimately we have to remember he's Catholic, right? So it's about- not Catholic. He's I mean, not Catholic. Was, but he's got he's 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 not Catholic at all. No, defending the church. No, he's he's part of the Orthodox tradition, which is very different. See the okay. well, but but at the very least, he's adhering to Christian principles. Yes. So right. So there's that adherence is in faith, right? That is a act of faith in and of itself because it's accepting that Christ has been revealed to you. So then therefore you're going to adhere to the principles that Christ teaches. Therefore it is that is the relationship to God, which is then you can determine what is good. So, so that faith is an adherence and acceptance, right? I mean, at, at the very least. So, so therefore you're adhering and accepting because you believe it's true. Look, um, Joe, Christianity is as large as philosophy. And right. the philosophy which is underpinning what you are saying about Christianity is exactly opposite of the philosophy which is underpinning the Christianity of Maximus. Very different. So that's why I would strongly, because- Okay, I, 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 just, I, just, I guess I'm missing where, uh, I guess not adhering to Christian principle. I, I, I don't know. I mean, then he's- I mean, he, I, I don't. I guess that would be the opposite of what I was saying. Is essentially not adhering. So adhering would be faith. And so I mean, that's. I guess that's where I'm kind of. And this is the idea of enduring knowledge and truth that I was coming back to. So I don't know. No, I, maybe I just, maybe we're just uh, missing each other here. Yeah. No. I. No. Absolutely. Because what happens is that like the the Western Christianity is very different from Eastern Christianity, and it is well worth studying it. Um, this is the older one. You know, basically, uh, this is the older one, like 880, like 700, 800. This is before 800, which is when Charlemagne took over. 
um, you know, before the coronation and what happened after that is very different from what is there. So, if, for example, um, you know, this is very much in Greek tradition, like most of the Western Christianity is in the Roman tradition. Um, so, so there is big differences, you know, even the text itself, you know, it is Jerome, which translates it into Latin. And there's all kinds of things that happen to it. Like, for example, my favorite one is the idea of uh, metanoia. Now, metanoia in for somebody like Ma Maximus, it's like noia is you have some ideas and you're continuously trying to move towards the infinite. So you are trying to go meta. That means you're going above your current ideas in order to pursue truth. It's a tremendously joyful, positive movement that is translated by Saint Jerome as penitentia, which moves into repentance. So this same concept, which is being used by people like Maximus as a tremendously positive thing, now has this entire negative valence of saying, what did you do wrong? And the focus is on that, which is very different. So this is a very large issue. Um, you know, so I, you know, that's what I, I don't know, uh, Joe, does that make sense to you? Do you see that there is kind of a, a, what I'm saying is that there is a dialogue as large as philosophy underpinning Christianity? Right. I, I, I mean, I, I, I definitely understand that part. I just, I'm just curious as to how you define faith. Then. Um, I would, in I the would, Christian, in the Christian sense. Look, I mean, so the best way, I, I don't have a very good answer to that. The okay. only thing I have is that the word belief and love is the same word in Old English. So it is really rooted in the Holy Spirit, but that has to stand with, you know, it comes always after Father and the Son. So it comes after reality. You look at reality, you use your mind the best you can and as a result of that you have love and so the belief comes after you know having this full acceptance that peter was talking about of of right. nature you know you're saying it is what it is then you're using your mind to the fullest and only then what comes is the holy spirit which is love which is what the belief is about. So it is very much, in, in my understanding, it is something which is a product. And if you, for example, say that Holy Spirit is primary, that faith is, pro, you know, I don't know how, as, as I said, you know, each of the problem with these words is that each person thinks of these words completely differently. So we're talking about different reference, only the same word. Okay, that's the most important thing. When you say, okay, well, how do you define faith? The question is, let's keep the word aside, you know, and look at what matters, what matters and in what order. And what, what Maximus is arguing is that it is that order, you know, you go and he's showing that like, you know, you have to do the right action because if your actions are screwed up, your mind cannot really do much. So you make sure that you try to do as best as you can. Then you use your mind to further, and, and when you engage your mind, your body is going to become even stronger of what it is able to do. So, so and then with that, the kind of love that you're going to have is really something that is worthwhile. So it is that hierarchy. That hierarchy is showing the same thing in the church. You enter the nave with your body, then you take the you know the, the part in the middle where the gospel is spoken, you use your mind to learn, and then you'll be able to approach in your heart the sanctum. That is the order. Um, so body is the foundation, then there is the mind, and then there is the heart. And that is a hierarchy that is being argued, argued for uh, throughout. And not all Christian faiths agree with this. You know, there are faces where right. only, you know, it is primarily the, the you know, the, the structure of the society. There you are going primarily for the physical organization as a primary. And that actually puts down 
the love in the heart of people or people's freedom of thought. Oh, that's then absolutely. There are people who are just intellectuals, who are just working with ideas, and right. they don't have any organization at all. And they are completely disconnected from their heart. Then there are people who are saying, okay, we are with Holy Spirit. organization is Holy primary. Spirit. Holy Spirit is, you know, primary to me. And when you do that, and you could do anything because you have no grounding in reality or your mind. So all of these are parts of Christianity. These are all, you know, different Christian traditions. And people approach Christianity that way because religion is philosophy. Just like people have all kinds of weird philosophies, even Christianity, people will have completely different takes on it. What I'm trying to present here is a way that Maximus and many of the church fathers, early church fathers, used to think. I see it as being in line with the um, gospel according to John. Um, I see very, very, you know, John, if you read, read him, you know, he has profound he's like an eagle so he's like he can talk about the deepest principles in the most beautiful and touching way and which are fully grounded in everyday experience all at once that's exactly what these people do like maximus does that again and again and again and again and again that's what he's trying to do he's saying the whole point here is that the structure of god structure of man and structure of society is the same um, so it is something really remarkable. So I would strongly recommend, don't think that, you, you know, you know, Christianity, look at all these people, look at all these people and you will find. Oh, no, I wasn't assuming that I'm perfect knowledge. That would be, I'd hear, that would be kind of, uh, contra yeah. so what I'm saying is that be, be open to what these people are saying, because what I'm saying is that they're saying something completely different than what, what you're thinking. Oh, okay. I mean, I, I, I kind of disagree. I mean, just respectfully, um, and, and I, I, my thought of, of how faith actually works into this equation. Um, and it's, it's possible that you know this better than I do. Okay. I, 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 I no, no. I, I mean, we both have our opinions, but I yeah, just think that absolutely. there is an element of, um, no, but the, the things that, uh, the first uh, principles that, that Aquinas does get to. Yeah. Joe, but you know, the thing is that if I, if I notice something, I believe in saying it, because I you're... agree with you. I, I appreciate it. that's yeah. the, well. That was what we started with tonight, right? That was the reason what we we yes. come here to learn and actually yes. to challenge each other's ideas and thoughts. And that's exactly. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Next up is Maritza. So, I view um, religious texts in the same way in which I view all philosophical works. I place them on the same platform, and I proceed from there. And great philosophers will spend time, they will take the time to define their terms. Um, some of them do it indirectly, most will do it kind of directly. And so if we are looking at this work now, I, full disclosure, I've really only read the chapter you presented to me here today. But looking at this chapter alone, I am not left to formulate my own concept of faith. It is provided for me. And I believe that invites me to set aside any of my own preconceived notions of what would define faith and instead use the one provided here in the text. And then using that is how I would invite anyone reading a philosophical work to move forward. You know, use their definition. And oftentimes philosophers are tackling concepts that we walk with every day. And so we really do have to embrace reason. And in doing so, it requires us to set aside the emotionality that's attached to certain concepts. Faith is a very loaded word. It means I, I would garner everyone here today would define it entirely differently. Um, and there are some universal thoughts for what faith would entail. But if we look at this 
chapter specifically, we are told that faith is the inward and unchangeable concretization of prudence, action, and virtue. And he also states before he gives that definition, he also um he also moves, he also explains to us that faith is but one component of what he's defining as truth. And if we want to remember again that this that this is a religious uh text, he also ties truth back to God with an equal sign. He literally says in this text, God is truth. So whenever we see truth in this rest of this chapter, our brain should equate that to God because we've been told that's the approach that the author is taking. Um, and so to me, that's how it does remind me that this is a spiritual person looking at it from their faith and their Sorry, their faith, right? So I, I use, you know, people use faith sometimes as religious belief. And he's he's told me already that his religious belief is that, you know, God equals truth. Faith is a component of truth. So if we're extrapolating, that means faith is also a component of God. And then he spends the rest of the chapter talking about how we're, Doing everything spins into this constant upward movement towards truth. And he's saying towards God. And faith is one very important aspect to get us there. Um, I love the line where he says, faith without works is dead. Well, he actually says that scripture says this. So he's reminding us about, you know, scripture saying this. And, and I like and he goes on, he talks about, you know, action. And I, I really like, you know, he's saying when by means of, of faith, it arrives. And by it, he's talking about truth. So when by means of faith, truth arrives at the good, which is its term, the reason ends its proper activities because its potency, habit, and act are now concluded. And I, I see him saying we've come full circle. And so it also says that we cannot get to the good, which he's also equated to truth, which he's already equated to God. So in order to get to these desirous things, we do have to pass through faith. And, and so I, if then we want to take liberties with the definition of faith, and incorporate some of our own emotional components. I think that circle, and you know, Judy kind of did it in in her diagram also that that circular, or you did say spiral, Srikant, that spiralization of the path gives us the wiggle room to include a more religious heavy conceptualization of this word of faith like you know um so i i think that the text is so well written that it transcends the need for any type of true religious consideration but I also see that it's interwoven in the very fire, fiber of the words. And I know that sounds kind of contradictory, but I think because the author does such a great job of giving us what terms he's using equate to which concepts, it gives us the breathing room we need to either embrace it from a very myopic viewpoint of one's religion or to embrace it from a more universal conceptualization of a philosopher pondering 
the very structure and fabric of what makes us, of what makes universe. Um, and so I, I I kind of see that there. And, 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 you know, for me, I'm always looking at how can I enjoy this text outside of it being purely a religious. So I'm hoping that makes sense. And I'm hoping that it it helps if anyone is tripping over, how can I enjoy this without it breaking my concept of what this term means? Does that, am I like way off base? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Maritza. I actually like it very much. And what I'm going to do is that I'm going to follow your example. And I just want to read through how he actually talks about faith, because I think it's going to help me a lot, because I've always had problems with the way in which people have talked about faith. Um, I, you know, I've always been, my, my short form has been that it's all about love um, based on knowledge. Um, but let, let's see how he's thinking about it. Okay, first point to note is that you see there is like mind and there is reason. Mind is pointing to the universal. Reason is pointing to action. Faith to Maximus. Right now, just focus on what Maximus is saying. Okay, everybody just focus on what Maximus is saying. We're trying to understand what Maximus means by faith. Okay, I'm trying to do that. Please try to do that. Okay, let's do that. Then we can talk about what everybody's idea about faith is. But let's at least try to get what he's saying. First point, as for reason. So he's talking about faith in the context of action in the world, not about about God. It's about the world. Faith is about the world to him. Through virtue, it comes to faith. Okay, through virtue, it comes to faith. The genuinely solid and infallible certainty of divine realities. So it's something about divine realities on earth. Next statement. Indeed, as scriptures has it, so I'm going to read all the quotations on faith. Okay, and let's see if we can see a pattern to that. Um, indeed, as the scriptures has it, faith without works is dead. Okay, so faith without works is dead. So that is another deep principle there. So without deeds. So again, it is connecting to actions. Remember that the sequence is reason is moved, is it is analogously moved by prudence and arrives at action. Through action, it comes to virtue. Through a virtue, it comes to faith. And finally, it is going to come to good. Okay. So faith without works is dead. Next. But when by means of faith, it arrives at the good, which is its term. So faith is aimed at good, not at truth. At good. But when by means of faith, it arrives at the good, which is its term. The reason ends its proper activities because its potency, habit, and act are now concluded. So faith ends with good. Or the goal of faith is good. Also that action is habit, that virtue is act, and that faith is the inward and unchangeable concretization of prudence, action and value so faith is an inward unchangeable concretization all right the next one virtue without knowledge faith without with okay oh this is very beautiful so reason with mind uh, let me see here nevertheless we should know that every soul by the grace of the Holy Spirit and his own works and diligence can unite these things and weave them into one another. Reason with mind, prudence with wisdom, action with contemplation, virtue with knowledge, and faith with enduring knowledge. So the enduring knowledge which is aimed towards God is going to be married with faith which is aimed towards action. All right, next one. Saying virtuous knowledge. So now he's saying 
that there is going to be rational mind, a prudent wisdom, an active contemplation, virtuous knowledge. He's pairing up both of them. The first one being the adjective. And then second one being, being the noun. Um, enduring knowledge, which is both very faithful and unchangeable. So because the enduring knowledge is unchangeable, that is the base uh, of faith. But that's my commentary, though. Uh, faithful of so virtue of knowledge and faith of enduring knowledge. Faith of enduring knowledge. So there is knowledge. So there is the mind which is pursuing contemplation, knowledge, enduring knowledge. And faith is tied. Faith in action is tied. Faith in goodness. Faith created by virtue, which is about action, is tied with the intellectual part. Uh, let's see if there is any more. Whence to faith, whereby it rests in good. So faith rests in the good, which is the blessed term for reasonable activities. Okay, so that's all I had. So any, any what, what did you guys get? What, how do you think Maximus try to summarize Maximus's view of faith, if you would like? I mean, the stunning thing for me is that he's saying most people think of faith about the, you know, about the high. He's saying faith is not about the high. Enduring knowledge is about the high. The faith is about action. When you have sustained action, it is the faith, uh, you know, it is based on enduring knowledge, based on the mind, uh, just like virtue is based on knowledge. Faith is based on enduring knowledge and it is moving in the direction of action. It is something, it's the, uh, you know, Bronowski had a very key point, you know, uh, I think in the last episode when he was trying to say, okay, what is the heart of what makes human beings so great? He's saying it is the skill. It is the confidence in your own skill. This is very similar confidence in your own virtue, in your own, that what you're pursuing is the actual good. It is actually in consonant with the divine reality. That confidence in your action, that is what he seems to be talking about as best as I can tell. But any, any comments? Joe, go ahead. I think you had it right the first time. I mean, the, um, uh, he's combining love and faith. That's the way, I, and that's what you had said, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to breaking them out. Uh, so that would differ than theological virtues in the sense of charity versus faith. So that he breaks, he combines them as to one. That's the way, the way I see it. As and so it's integrated, as you said. Um, but it's, uh, but I, I think that it's also important to also keep in mind that this is Christianity. I mean, so it's about Christ. So it, fundamental to everything is Christ. So it, it's understanding God's Son is 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 the revelation of all of this. So I think that that's uh, um, fundamental. But I I think I I really agree with what you said earlier. In that faith and love, uh, he integrates those two. Yeah, very nice. Very nice. That's a very good observation. I had not realized that. <laughs> that very nicely. Very nicely done. Yeah, yeah it is. Uh, you know, he's he's exactly doing doing that. Uh, he's putting faith and love together, and that is really pointed to the world. It is you know God so loved the world, so it is your faith in the world in the in in you know your love for the world. Uh, very good. Uh, next up is Evanique. Yeah, thank you, Shurkat, for tonight. Um, I think where the way I see it is um, through the discussion is that faith is the display of love. And 
when he talks about um, faith without works is dead, which is directly from scripture, I think that's the crux of it. That's the heart of it is that faith is a display of love. So if you look at it like that, then you realize it doesn't matter what people think. Um, it doesn't matter, you know, you're not trying to, you said something earlier, you're not trying to impress anybody. Like Maximus was not trying to impress anybody with his speech. I think if you're just trying to, dis I mean, I think it, it, I think when you have love, it is truly displayed in faith. And it's not something that you have to try to do. You just do it because you have love. And you have love of Christ. Since we are talking about Christianity, when you have love of Christ, it shows. And even when you mess up, it's still, you kind of, well, you do. You apologize and you make amends. Not because of some duty in the sense of, oh, this is what I have to do. And they're just words. It's because you love. And when you love, you and you realize that you may have hurt people, um, you make up for it. You try you, you try to make it better because of love. And that's where it comes down to that faith, true faith is a display of love. Oh, this oh, is both both uh, what you said and what Joe said, because I had I I just had this way of thinking about it. I never really thought about it. It's like that's the only way I can think about it. But uh, what um, you know, because it see this is like to me is very natural. You saying look, um, this is you know you you you. It it is a product. You know it is, it is it. Is saying really, amen, to the world. You know, it starts by saying yes, you know, yes to the world. And then you're saying, okay, I'm going to use my full mind, my full strength, and my full heart uh, in doing this. So it, it brings all of those things uh, together. So, um, wow. All right, folks. So this has been quite a conversation. Okay, I, I really, really like this. Um, I'm going to try to beat this one on Friday because I'm going to talk about Trinity. And I have some uh, show and tell. I have some props that are arriving tomorrow. I was tempted. I've been thinking about Trinity quite a bit. Um, and uh, wait a minute, Judy, you go ahead. Yes, I'm um, sorry to interrupt, but um, I I was looking and to see if, if I have the announcement for Friday. I made the announcement. I wanted to announce it here in live, and then oh. I'll, I'll, oh, okay. I'll do it by tomorrow. I don't want to miss it. Oh no! <laughs> Thank don't, you. Don't miss it. It's going to be very good. It's Thank you. This has been very enlightening. Thank you very much. Yes. So, um, it's really powerful, you know. And by the way, um the entire philosophy of Maximus is Christocentric. So whatever the common understanding of Christ is, he, he has at least thousand times more than that. He's very, very deep on, on, in understanding of Christ. So um, I would strongly recommend him because he's like, he's saying, he, he takes like everything, you know, he's it's like saying, oh, he's the word. And if he's the word, so it's like his, his level of understanding of Christ. I've never seen anything like that. Um, and this is, you know, compared to all the other church fathers. Okay. So it's just, it's just something else. So I would recommend, um, let's see, if you want to read Maximus, um, of the thing I would recommend um, is actually a short lecture by Maximos, uh, M-A-X-I-M-O-S, on mystagogy. So if you search for, you know, the words mystagogy. Um, Joe, can you do that? Uh, yeah, it is very much like the Gospel of John. Absolutely. He's 
See, it's it's like this. Okay, there is a Johannine tradition. Let's see. Look, it's like Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, right? The Johannine tradition is very much the Son tradition. Okay. Now, it's this is a very artificial way of separating it. Like some of the um, like when you become too structured, you become like the Father. You know, you become saying that social structures are the primary things, and let's build a big church which has all these rules and we'll just make sure that everybody obeys that and we'll be able to build something very big. So you're just focused on things in the world, right? Then there are people saying, no, 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 they rebel against it. And they say, look, my heart is important. And they're right. But then they're trying to express their heart in contradiction with what the world is, in contradiction with what the thoughts are, you know, the way of understanding. The Johannine approach is centered on Christ. It is centered on the word. And what that does is that word is always pointing to the father. And the word is always full of, of, um, of love. So if you have the mind, because he is the symbol, he's the one who is thrown together, the body and the heart. It's the mind which integrates the body and the heart. And you can't integrate it without that. That's what John does. Uh, John does. Um, and that's what that's what Maximus does. Maximus, I mean, his writing is um is the only writing I've found which is kind of as good. Not he's not as good as John, but he's um he is he kind of gets there, gets up there. Um, and of course, he's expanding it uh, dramatically. So it's it's wonderful. Yes, mystagogy of uh, Maximus the Confessor. There is a whole series of lectures on this uh, in this particular series that uh, Joe has put on that. Uh, but it's the uh, Maximus Costa. Costa. So he's the one who organized it. He's one of the key scholars on Maximus. Uh, I'm reading his Ambigua, which is a very long book, I think like thousand pages or something like that uh that i'm going through um and i'm i'm telling you you know it's just a way of thinking which is so far beyond anything else i've seen that i would i would recommend it and it, all it has is basically it's like a john uh gospel of john expanded dramatically and applied and he never wrote anything systematic people just would come and ask him questions and he would answer them that's all he has done uh, but it's just uh, spectacular. Of course, he, he answers them in like 100 page letters. But all right, folks. So thank you so much. And I'm I'm really grateful to everybody. Um, and because this is a really, you know, this is such a such a core topic. And uh, Maritza, thank you that, uh, you know, I think, I think you added a lot to to this discussion. And uh, I'm glad this is the first, I think, Bible based meetup that you have attended. And uh, it's uh, it was, but as I said, I mean, this is why I'm studying uh, Maximus. You know, it is actually the best example of this worldly use of reason, and the most kind of full, full on science and full on engineering in an integrated way, which fully integrates with the heart. That's what he does, and it's quite spectacular. All right, thank you, folks. Bye, everybody. See you.